John Gilbert was born in 1897 in the town of Logan, Utah, where his family had emigrated from England as Mormon pioneers. His mother was an actress and his father was a traveling producer. They went to stock companies all over the country. They were continually on the road so that he had no real childhood home. He had very little formal education. They couldn't bring toys. He didn't have friends. He just lived in the theater. He taught himself to read by holding his mother's script and hearing what she said and would figure out what the words were. And once he did learn, he read everything in sight voraciously all his life. So when Jack was 15, his mother died and his stepfather told him that he was on his own from there, that he had no ability to support a child. So he gave him $15 and sent him out to uh, San Francisco. He said, there are a lot of jobs out there. Since the earthquake, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. You'll be fine. So this kid got out on a train to San Francisco and struggled to keep himself alive. He did all kinds of menial jobs. He finally got a, a job selling tires for the Goodyear Rubber Company and uh, drifted around. But he had this dream of the movies. He, the one thing he afforded himself was to go to the movies. They were 10 cents. And he fell in love with them. He thought that this was the most exciting thing to be a part of. And eventually he wrote to his stepfather again and said, could you introduce me to somebody? So anything I, way I can get into the movies? And Walter Gilbert said, all right, I'll try it. He wrote to uh, Tom Ince, who ran a ramshackle studio in, in Santa Monica, and sent him some photographs and said the boy had had some stage training. And Ince wrote back and said, uh, if he cares to come down, we will give him a, a contract and pay him $15 a week. Well, Jack was in heaven. He thought that's all he needed to do, just, just get a toehold. So he went down and joined the Tom in Circus, as they called it. And he, it was, the movie business was very primitive. Uh, people did everything. Uh, he swept the floors, he painted sets, he, uh, he wrote scripts, he worked in the uh, editing department, he tinted films. There wasn't an aspect of making movies that he didn't learn and know every part of. He was the first real movie person, and his career went on from there. He, William S. Hart noticed him, he was a great Western star, and put him in one of his movies that's available called Hell's Hinges. And you can see Jack in the background trying to get a little closer to the camera and putting his face in here, and then William S. Hart said, every time I turned around I tripped over Jack Gilbert, you know. But, but he was noticed and people were watching him. He had met my mother, Leatrice Joy, who was an actress, and they were in a casting office together, and he noticed that she was off in a corner praying. He thought, oh, isn't that wonderful? She was a devout Christian scientist, and of course they pray a lot. So uh, he said it must have worked because they both got jobs. He was fascinated by her. She was Southern, which he liked, and she had these lovely green eyes and black hair, and she was overwhelmed by him. He was, he was such a presence. She said, you felt the glow of him. Just uh, He was marvelously attractive. And so they started going out. But Leatrice's mother was very unhappy because she considered him a married man. And this was not what he had to fool around with. But you can't stop love once it starts. And so eventually they ran off to Tijuana, Mexico and were married. <laughs> sort of. And uh, they built a house in Laurel Canyon and went on uh, working together sometimes when they could. But the marriage was not too successful because they were both very egotistical about their careers. Mother's career meant more to her than anything else and so did Jack's. And you get two egos like that and it's very hard to make compromises. And I think that that's really what separated them. They fought and came back together and fought and came back together, but after about two and a half years, it was over. But in the meantime, they'd had me. <laughs> By this time, Jack was under contract to William Fox, which was a movie-making factory. They were very short, cheap films that ground out, I don't know how many a week, 
But he was being paid $1,500 a week, which was good for that time. But mother was at Paramount and uh, doing very good films for Samuel Goldwyn and making much more money than he was. So this was a point of friction. But in all of the potboiler films that he was making, only two of the Fox films are still around, and one was The Count of Monte Cristo, which is not bad at all. Uh, you could see him growing and getting relaxed in front of a camera and doing interesting things, and it was a success. They actually made a lot of money. And after that, he was put in uh, to the, a film directed by a newcomer to Hollywood called John Ford, who had only directed one or two films before, and this was a Western uh, Mississippi gambler a movie called Cameo Kirby. And Jack wore his wonderful costumes, the lace shirts and heavy cameos around his neck, and was very glamorous. And people were suddenly alerted to the fact that this was a serious actor. It was a very good role. And the young woman opposite him was Jean Arthur, who went on to become a star. But it was in this movie that people were remembering many years later when Mother and I went out to the set of Gone with the Wind and David Selznick said to her, you know, Leatrice, we buried the man who should have played Red Butler because it was a segue from, it would have been a natural fit. <laughs> One of the people who saw Jack in Cameo Kirby and was deeply impressed was Irving Thalberg, who was the young genius at MGM. And he said, I don't think Fox knows what they have there. Jack Gilbert could be a star. And so he, met, he started coaxing him to leave Fox, break his contract, and come to MGM, which people were doing in those days. They went from place to place. So he went to MGM. It was a beautiful studio. It, it was new. And they were beginning to make interesting films. Jack soon began his collaboration with King Vidor, beginning with a film based on Eleanor Glynn's his Hour. Eleanor Glynn was an English woman who wrote things like extended Barbara Cartland plus ten, I mean over-the-top heavy romances, and they were ridiculous, and Jack thought it was ridiculous, and so did King Vidor, but they plowed through it and made it, and everyone loved it. Women adored it especially, lots of lovemaking uh, in a troika under the snow and all that. But both King and Jack were dissatisfied with that kind of movie. So they made one more together called Wife of the Centaur, which was about a, a, a professor who was unfaithful to his wife. And Jack liked that because he got to play a really mean villainous part. He always liked to play those. But uh, it, again, it was not up to the standards that these two men had hoped for themselves. Irving Thalberg was not as displeased with those films as King and Jack were. He could see that Jack was growing and developing and they had bought the rights to Franz Lehar's The Merry Widow, and he wanted to make a movie of that, and he thought this was perfect for Jack. And they hired Mae Murray, who played the part of the princess on Broadway, and started a, an expensive, well-written, well-produced film. And Jack was in heaven. He loved it. And they went to lengths to make it as high quality as they could. And he and Mae Murray clicked well together, and their dance was spectacular. And it was directed by uh, Werner von Stroheim, who hated their whole concept. He wanted something very dark and middle European, but uh, it went anyway. And after that film opened, Jack was writing in his uh, memoir that he suddenly walked down the street and he could hear people saying, why, that's, that's John Gilbert. Oh, look, that's Jack. Hello. Hi, Jack. Hello. Hello, Jack. He said, I would thrill. I couldn't believe that I was being recognized. And he had indeed become a star. The next collaboration between King Vidor and Jack was based on a play by Lawrence Stallings called The Big Parade. It was a World War I story. The war, war was recently over, and everyone was deeply concerned about it and they felt passionately about it. And this film was not a glorification of war, it was an exploration of 
an average American soldier's life going to battle and how he survived it and what his experience was. And it was the first realistic movie of that type to have been made of a war scene. And it, it, they, it became incandescent. They were just, they were both so excited. Vitor and Jack were so excited about what they had there. And Irving Thalberg was watching the rushes, the little films as they came in, and he got just as excited. So they began pouring more money into it. And they ended up hiring a whole army corps at Kelly Field, Kansas, and shooting all this with tanks and trucks. And it became an epic film, just based on this one soldier's life. Shortly after my father died, mother and I were invited to Metro Goldwyn Mayer by Irving Thalberg for a private screening of the big parade. And it was a, a very wrenching moment for both of us because he, his death was deeply affecting. And uh, when I saw him as this young man on the screen, I, I cried just unbearably and I finally had to be taken out and they had to start it all over again. But I'm glad I saw it. I've seen it many times since and it's still my favorite Gilbert film. King Vidor and Jack met again on a subsequent film called Bartley's The Magnificent that has been missing for 50 years. And nobody knew where it was. It was supposed to be one of the lost films. The only thing that was not lost was a still of Jack and Eleanor Boardman in an open boat drifting beneath a willow tree and the leaves came down and the shadow and the lights were so beautiful that this has been held up in film school as a perfect a uh, still picture, and we never knew what went before or afterwards. So suddenly these films began turning up, and that was one of them. And it's been reconstructed, beautifully done, and it turns out that instead of being a sloppy old romance or something, it's a, it's a very elegant satire and rather a spoof on some of the pictures that were being made at that time with a lot of... Uh, interesting love scenes, but also with Jack doing a Douglas Fairbanks, scaling walls, swinging on ropes, and heroic cries of triumph, and it's much fun to watch. And it's well directed, and I think that it was a good thing that it turned up. It's really a delightful picture. Greta Garbo was a young Swedish actress, and she was imported by Louis B. Mayer, and he thought maybe he could use her. Well, they weren't sure what to do with her. She was statuesque. She was not animated. She did not look like a sweet little girl like most of the early film stars did. She was a different breed of cat entirely. But they finally found a vehicle that they thought would be good for her, a heavy romance called Flesh and the Devil, based on a heavy German novel. And they put her opposite John Gilbert. Well, she had seen the big parade a number of times in New York when she was on her way west, and she had already formed a very strong attachment to this glamorous actor, and she had great respect for him, could hardly wait to meet him. Clarence Brown, the director, uh, brought her to his dressing room and introduced them, and he said, you could feel the magic going on right between them. They just looked at each other and it was sizzling. It was astonishing. It was just, there it was. And when they started shooting pictures together, uh, they opened at a railroad station when he looks at this woman getting out of the train and walking across and he's like this, you know, transfixed. I mean, she is the most beautiful thing you ever saw. Gorgeous face, moves like a tiger, you know, lovely. Um, he said their romance was so apparent that sometimes when they were in the middle of a love scene, you would simply have to close down the set and move the cameras off to another part of the, stu the stage and then come back when it was calm again. And he said it was, a, it was a real passionate love affair and it came across on the films. You couldn't miss it. The love was there. At the same time that Gilbert and Garbo were getting together, Rudolf Valentino was struck with an ailment and died very suddenly at a very young age, leaving his fans bereft. I mean, thousands and thousands of women attended his funeral and were deeply grieved. He was very popular. 
And as soon as they got used to his being gone, they looked around for someone else to adore. And who was there but John Gilbert? And they went to the romances with Garbo, and they just loved them because the, the love was there. And it was, uh, it was photogenic, and it was commercial, and they bought millions of tickets. Uh, it was a very successful uh, combination. They call it fire and ice. <laughs> Much to Jack's chagrin and real distress, Irving Thalberg created the title of the great lover for him. John would rather have been called garbage. He simply couldn't stand that concept. He hated that kind of movie. He hated that kind of characterization. But it sold tickets, and that's where the business was. So he was stuck with it. Great lover of the silent screen. People used to greet him like that. Hello, great lover of the silent screen. <laughs> <He'd> say, ah. <laughs> when talkies came in with Al Jolson and the jazz singer, Hollywood did not take it seriously at first. Most people thought it was a passing fad, and they didn't worry about it. The producers didn't worry about it, but the actors did. Some of the studios started giving them voice tests. And it's very interesting to me that no one gave John Gilbert a voice test. If his voice was as screechy as the myth has said, why didn't somebody find that out? So uh, he was very nervous. He had been uh, he had acted on the stage as a child, and he had listened to his mother speak with what they called pear-like tones. They enunciated very clearly, hello, how are you? And when he started ma making sound in a movies, that's how he started speaking, because he thought that was what actors did when they talked. And in his first silent film, that's what came over, and that's what they laughed at. He was saying to this young woman, I love you, I love you, oh, I love you, and they roared. But it wasn't the sound of his voice, it was the way he had been trained to speak as an actor. So he had to undo all that. Jack still had that ironclad contract that he had written with Nicholas Skenk, that was guaranteeing him $250,000 a picture, choice of subject, choice of director, and Mayer couldn't break it. But they did manage to steer his choice of films into less than the kind of thing he would have liked to have done. He made some all right movies. He made one, uh, The Phantom of Paris, that was good by uh, Gaston Leroux. It was a romantic mystery. But at one point he did, he wrote his own script with his friend Marta Bell called Downstairs. And in it he played the kind of part he really liked it was the villainous chauffeur who insinuated himself into an aristocratic family and tore the place apart. And everyone who saw it thought he, it was a great performance. But again, it was not what the fans wanted to see from John Gilbert. You know, they wanted Prince Gritzko. You know, they wanted uh, something very different. So that the contract ground on, and as it went on, the studio did everything they could to make him uncomfortable. He had, by the, by the laws of the contract, he had to show up at the studio whether he was working or not. So every day he would drive up and sometimes the gateman would pretend not to recognize him and he had to show identification to get in. And uh, he was left out of uh, celebrations and things. I believe the reason for this was that Mayer was afraid that if they just let him go at the end of his contract, he could easily have gone to another studio. Fox wanted him back, which was a different studio by then, or uh, United Artists that had just been started with Mary Pickford and Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks. They were all his friends. They were pleading with him to come. But that would have been a harsh competition for MGM. So that it was logical for them, if they're going to get rid of their biggest money-making star, they had to destroy him. And he was a fragile character anyway, and given to drinking, and this just ground him down and down and down. And so by the time the contract finally petered out, 
he just withdrew back to his house and uh, didn't have much to live for. While Jack was making The Captain Hates the Sea, the director was Lewis Milestone. And they had been friends for a long time. Milestone admired Jack and had followed his career. And one night he invited some friends to dinner and among the guests was Marlena Dietrich, who was fairly new to Hollywood and didn't have many friends. And in the conversation around the dinner table, he said, what a tragedy it was that John Gilbert was sitting just a few miles up the road and everything was there. He had his looks, he had his intelligence, he had his skills, and he was just drinking himself to death. And uh, how, why should this happen? Wasn't there anything that anyone could do? It was so sad. And at that point, Marlena Dietrich arose from the table and said, I shall save him. Out the door she went, she got in her car, drove up, rang the doorbell, and he answered and said, she said, John Gilbert, I have come to save you. <laughs> and here was this gorgeous woman. I mean, Marlena was probably, along with Garbo, two of, they were two of the most beautiful women ever to be in Hollywood. And all of her lovely furs and her evening gown and everything. It was, it, I don't know what Jack made of her. But this was a very determined German lady, and nothing was going to get in the way of her project, which was to save this valuable man. And by golly, she did. She got him to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Uh, she got him to stop drinking for a while, and she made him eat. And she took him places and made him go out and see people. And she was arranging for him to make a film in England with her, it was one called Knights Without Armor at the uh, Film Tree Studio in London. And they were all excited about this, and he thought that he was going to have another chance, from having come back really from hell to a hopeful future. And that was the time, I didn't realize what was going on in his life, but I was about eight, I guess, and I. I missed having a father very much, and so I wrote him a fan letter, and I sent it to the studio. I said something to the effect, uh, I don't have a picture of you, uh, and I'd like to have one, and maybe sometime I could see you. And I gave him my address and said, I hope we can be in touch or something, you know, I don't remember. But a month or so went by and I heard nothing, and I forgot about it, you know, I just went on to school. And then one day I came home, and here was a huge bouquet, I mean, a floral arrangement like, like, like a funeral parlor, just gigantic. And I said to our maid, Sarah, I said, what, who's that for? And she said, that's for you, your father sent it. I said, what? You know, I hadn't remember seeing him since I was a little girl at the beach. You know, I, I, I really didn't know him at all. And so he responded with an enormous way and a and a little card that said, I adored your mother, let me adore you. <sighs> you talk about romance. <laughs> Dear me. We spent hours together. Uh, he tried to teach me how to play chess. And once we had rolled up the rugs and he taught me to waltz around the living room. And then we would just sit and talk. And he treated me as if I were 40 years old. You know, he would say, well, now, Leatrice, What's your take on Roosevelt? And I would give a considered answer because uh, I tended to be liberal in my politics even then, and I thought he was doing good things for the country. And he said, well, how do you feel about prohibition? And I said, I don't think it's going to work. He said, you're right, you're absolutely right, you're my own daughter. You know? <laughs> we had these funny kind of lopsided conversations that were so much fun. and. Uh, I went away to summer camp and he wrote to me all the time I was there and I wrote back to him. And in one he said, you fill a great void in my life and I hope we will be together forever. And then when I got back, I saw him once more in the fall and then I went to spend Christmas day with him. And I went up the stairs, it was a house on several levels and you entered down there and you walked up the stairs and at the top of the stairs there was a great, beautiful, 
Christmas tree, hung with the most gorgeous ornaments and lit with candles. I'd never seen a candlelit tree before or since, but evidently Marlene Dietrich had decorated it in the German tradition. And the tree, around the tree were, oh, 20, 30 presents, all for me. You know, what kind of a dream that was, you know. And he sat and watched me rip into these presents and there were lovely things, a gold watch, a little silk dress, uh, a bracelet, just all kinds of stuff. And we had this happy closeness. It was, I'd never had with an adult before. We really connected, you know, we, we, we laughed at the same things. And I persuaded him to drive home with me in the limousine that day. I wanted him to see the Christmas tree I had decorated at home. He said, oh no, I, I, don't, have to, I don't want to come to your mother's house. No, no, no. And I said, yes, you must come. He said, young lady, you're arguing with a Gilbert. And I said, so are you. Well, he howled. He thought that was the funniest thing. So he got in the car and we go trundling across the other side of Los Angeles. And uh, we walked in the door and my mother came down the stairs and she suddenly started clutching her throat, you know. <laughs> and there he was. And they were still so young and they were still so beautiful. And just to watch them there for a few minutes together was very touching. And that was the last time I ever saw him. He had had a heart attack the summer before when he was swimming in the pool with Marlene Dietrich. And they pulled him out and it was all right, he survived. But he was continued to have heart trouble. And I think he had gone back. He, 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 Marlena at this point had felt that she had made her point and had begun having a dalliance with Gary Cooper. And I think that was the straw that broke his fragile back. And I was to go and see him on the 9th of January. And we couldn't go. And the next day I was in school. And my mother came to get me and told me in the car on the way home that my father had died that night. And no one likes losing a parent, but in this case, I had placed such hopes and plans. You know, I had not had a close relationship with my mother particularly, and my stepfather was not, he didn't like children at all. He didn't even like his own children. <laughs> And I had created this dream image of a father who did know who I was and cared and that we were going to go on and I would grow up talking to him. And I probably put much too much emphasis on what was going to be because when it was pulled away, it was as if the world ended for me for a long time. And then as I grew older, I began to realize that his reputation as an actor was being trashed. Not only an actor, but as a man. They were, the, you know, who was it? Was it George Lucas who said, if you have to choose between the truth and a myth, go with the myth? Well, the myth about Jack was what went, and it was not true. He was not a shallow, awkward man. He, he was he, so many people realized what a good actor and worthwhile human being he was, and this was completely obliterated. And when I, in 1970, I went to see a film of The Merry Widow at the Museum of Modern Art. I hadn't seen many of its films, and I looked at this glistening presence. I said, my God, he's been totally forgotten. He was a footnote. In, move, in books about films. It was as if he hadn't even been there. And it just energized me. I had to do something about it. And so I started doing research. I, it took me 12 years. I, was, I went out to California and interviewed all the people who had known him, the people who had been out at Ince, the people who had been at Fox with him, his old girlfriends, people who had worked for him, and got their stories. And I'm so glad I did, because by the time the book finally came into life, which was 10 or 12 years later, though most of them were gone. You know, I stayed at King Vidor's, and his daughter was enormously helpful to me. 
she put me in touch with people I wouldn't have known. So this, the reconstruction began and I think it is happening now. His movies are being shown at film festivals and in film schools and he is being re-examined as someone who contributed greatly to the movie industry.